I'm a Gemini. I always noticed I had two personalities. There are two sides to Billy. There's the Billy who just wants to do the right thing. And then there's the criminal lurking from within. And then as I got older, I could kind of switch to the other person. Billy had conflicting influences growing up. My grandfather worked for the mafia. I had uncles that were cops. But my grandfather was very well respected because he was a respected member of the mafia in our area. And I felt safe with my grandfather because he was a tough SOB. I did not know what he was doing, but we go to coffee shops or even bars and I get a soda or coffee shops and I get a donut and a soda and he was making collections. <laughs> so you would just go to restaurants and people would just give you free stuff? Yes, for me and I got to, <laughs> I'd sit at the bar and he'd be talking to somebody and half the time I didn't, I never finished my soda because it was always like, we gotta go, you know, we gotta go. <laughs> yeah, and so tell me about your uncle being in law enforcement. Well, he was a deputy police chief of Utica. He rose to the ranks and I respected him, but I enjoyed the time with my grandfather more. I just knew in my heart, I never wanted to be a cop. As a teenager, I liked the criminal activity more. <laughs> so you were, you were kind of fighting these two, the dark side and the light side your whole life, and you were drawn to the dark side. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. And then for whatever reason, when I start to see my cousins coming out of jail, I said, that's not for me either. I start to see the light. And I said, well, but I was always fascinated by the criminal element. And I always was fascinated being an investigator, trying to solve stuff. So which way did he go? Did Billy end up becoming a criminal or did he choose to be the good guy in his own story? Well, he decided to do both. So lean back, relax, grab your adult beverage of choice. Because today we're going to spend the next half hour or so chatting with Billy the liquor guy. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. If you've listened to the show long enough, you know that I go to great lengths to fact check my episodes. But today is different because it's tough to corroborate Billy's stories. And that's okay. One of my favorite movies of all time is Big Fish with Ewan McGregor. It's about a man whose father lived an extraordinary life. In the end, it turns out that most of his father's tall tales were true, but just a little skewed due to time. And that's how I feel about Billy. Some of these stories are too incredible to be real, but they might be. He's always wrestled between being the good guy and the bad guy. And in the end, he managed to be both a criminal and a cop. You know, you ended up picking the light side, right? You went into yes. law enforcement. Right. But you said you didn't think like a cop. I did not. What was your degree in? My degree was in actually... <clears throat> I got a criminal justice degree from my community college, and I got a degree in sociology <laughs> and a minor in sociology and a major in criminal justice from Buff State. Uh, even then, it was uh, different. I, stuff I did in college, I did anything I do to get to get by in college. I've heard, I've heard that people get a hold of tests before. I've heard people cheat or do that. I did figure out how they did it, but but of course I would never do anything like that. You know what I'm saying? In college. <laughs> but so how did you start working in law enforcement? What was your first gig? It started out, I actually started as a county civil investigator, which is civil, they're civil and criminal. And I enjoyed the work. And actually I volunteered to serve summonses too, because a little more exciting. Well, I noticed that even when I was an investigator, you also had to deal with people evading their taxes, like uh, mom and pop stores. And I just could not do that. 
You know what I'm saying? I went in there and said, listen, this is what you got to change. But, you know, they said, but you're not arresting these people. Like, well, I'm not going to arrest anybody that works 80 to 100 hours a week and might cheat on there, as you say, not pay all the, you know, and I just, I got in a lot of trouble with my supervisors at the time. And, you know, I used to call my boss Dudley Do Right and me Studley Do Wrong. So you're probably wondering, how did he get the name Billy the Liquor Guy? You know, some people know me, they go, are you Billy the Liquor Guy? I go, uh, <laughs> yes, I am. Billy got tired of investigating civil cases and decided to call it quits. So he opened up a bar in Utica, New York. I had a bar. During the bar, I did a lot of illegal things. I bought a bar for, I had like for four years, involved in it for six. After six years of serving liquor that may or may not have been taxed, he decided to go back into law enforcement. When I was assigned to the Petroleum Alcohol Tobacco Bureau, they all thought I was in the mob. Billy says he wasn't exactly a shoe in During his onboarding, his managers, or what he calls the Dudley Do-Rights, had many questions. Because I figure he's got my folder out, want to know about the mafia, want to know about the bar. He goes, so what, what can you tell me about the bar business? I said, well, I worked there from four in the afternoon to two in the morning. And I started, he goes, listen, I don't want to hear that shit. What did you do in the bar business to learn the criminal activity? And even then I said, well, I've heard. People work with, they order stuff on the side. They covered it up by having two cash registers, you know, one that's not turned in for your records. Billy worked many years as an investigator for the Petroleum, Alcohol, and Tobacco Bureau. PATB is a law enforcement organization for the New York State Office of Tax Enforcement. You know, there shouldn't be an overlap in the Venn diagram of criminal and cop, but Billy managed to find a comfortable spot in between. During the interview process, they asked to see his records from the time when he owned the bar. I go, we had a big fire, burnt everything up. Everything got burned up with her, my bar records. Of Billy says he never left a trail. On paper, he was a model citizen. We've been looking at him for years. We can't find anything he ever did illegal. So he says, don't even try. Everything came easy to do stuff illegal. And it just started since I was a little kid to weave my way through trouble and I thought I'd never get caught at it. But once I got to be 18, 19, I go, you know, your uncle's not going to help you forever. But it was always there in my criminal mind. I never, ever, ever thought like a cop. That, that's so sad to say, but I never did. I remember once they were, they were going to raid a place in Utica that was a bookie joint. And they wanted my bosses, the Dudley Durights, wanted to know what I knew about it. I go, I, I know nothing. They would not even let me work in Utica because that was my hometown. They figured because I was Italian that I knew everybody. They want to know the information, but they would not let me go on the raid. But you know what? Someone notified that bookie joint that they were going to get raided the next morning. So, and that was you? Yes, it was. My, my, my bosses were pissed. These are people I know. All those statute limitations are a long time gone, I hope. But anyways, I grew up in with a family Italian environment that you don't rat out your friends. That's, you know, and you do what you can to provide the best for your family. Working in law enforcement, why was that so appealing to you? I just felt, I felt I was not doing anything that was very interesting. Before I became Billy the Liquor Guy, they would use me on some undercover ops. Say they were looking at some tax issues at a country club or a golf course or a bar. The first day I went right into the bar, told them I said I had one of the other guys with me. I went right in there and said, listen, I'm doing a stag party for my idiot son, future son-in-law. What can you do for me? You know, and they gave me exposed everything. Well, I said, listen, I don't want to pay taxes. They go, no problem. And I got all that recorded. Now, I felt a little bad. But on the other hand, I got such a high of doing that, especially when they're working on it for three months. And I go in there for one time and I get all the information they needed. Okay. you're one of them, right? Yes, it was. Yes. I pushed the envelope a lot. You know, I, said, I, I won't say I broke laws, but I pushed the envelope a lot to get things done. <laughs> Machiavelli. Right? Yes, yes. Let me explain. Modern day bootlegging still exists. You see, some states charge more tax on liquor, wine, and beer than others. For example, you could buy a six bottle case of vodka for $167 in Indiana, but the same case of vodka will cost you $60 more if you buy it in Illinois. Did you know that New York State has one of the highest taxes on cigarettes? Just to give you an example, the average state tax in the United States for a pack of cigarettes is $1.91, but in New York State, it costs $4.35 more for a pack of smokes. 
And bootleggers know this. Crossing state borders means enormous profits. And it wasn't just mobsters and wise guys ripping off state governments. Terrorists were getting in on the game too. When those planes crashed into the Twin Towers, the question was, how did the terrorists fund their operation? Since 9-11, the U.S. government has linked several smuggling rings with terror organizations. They weren't selling guns or drugs. They were selling untaxed cigarettes, but they were selling them in the bodegos in New York City, which is they can make 10 times the amount of profit. They were getting millions of dollars from the sales of untaxed cigarettes. When we come back, Billy the Liquor Guy goes undercover. To say Billy struggled with authority is an understatement, but he made it work. Billy enjoyed his job at the Petroleum Alcohol and Tobacco Bureau, and the Dudley Do-Rights seemed to like him. In fact, my boss, Tom Stanton, noticed that. He goes, I hear you're an expert at thinking out of the box. You know, talking to me, we talked for about an hour. He goes, you're natural. He goes, I'm going to send you to undercover school. Undercover school? I didn't even know such a thing existed. Definitely will have to be a future episode. I can only imagine Billy, a six-foot, 280-pound guy who looks like he just walked off the set of The Sopranos, stumbling into this classroom. You're now in undercover school. Right. You're like in this big auditorium, right? Right. And one of these things is not like the other. (laughs) Yeah. It's... There's 40 guys in there and they're all, I'm, I'm not, 39 are all cut. You know, they look like cops, short haircuts. They're good at what they do, I imagine, but they had pressed t-shirts or polo shirts on, khaki pants and loafers. And I got untied sneakers, wind pants and a dirty ass t-shirt. The instructor walks around, walks around and he, and he focuses right on me and he looks at me. He goes, did you think about what you're going to wear today or just, did you just pick it up off the floor? And I don't know where this came from. In an instant, I said, no, your mother told me what to wear. And I figured, okay. Silence, which was probably only what it seemed like eternity. He goes, well, my mother knows best. I'm glad. You look like you, you're going to get made. Probably shot. You look like him, you're going to be accepted as a, a degenerate. Kind of a backhanded compliment, right? It was. He kind of took me under his wing and just said, you know, I expect a lot of you. He says, you got a gift. The next story is great, but it's almost hard to believe. It was the last day or two. The, the two guys I rode with who were cops, they wanted my expertise of what was going on. So I sat back at a police car just to observe. And the guy was at a storage facility, a gentleman driving a van. He was a, I'll say, I'm a, a redneck. Nice guy, but he was very country. Anyways, he was getting cigarettes from the warehouse, loading them into his van, and then was bringing them different places. But they weren't sure what he was doing. They just knew he was smuggling something. They had an idea with cigarettes. So long story short, we're sitting there for a few hours during the night, cold, really cold, wintry night. And I'm sitting there going, gentlemen, what are you going to do when he leaves? They said, well, we we're going to follow him a little bit. I go, but he's a wholesaler. You want to find out where he gets the stuff from. And they go, well, how do you figure we do that? My mind, again, it just clicked. I start taking all my clothes off at the back of the car. I got down to my sneakers and my skivvies. <laughs> and they start, what are you, nuts? I said, just, they drove me around, dropped me off next door to where the gate was. There I am thinking, oh, are you out of your mind? So I jumped in front of the van coming out. And there I am in my you know, boots and underwear freezing my ass off and he stopped the van i gave him some song and dance story like i was just you know running away from a female situation i had to get out of the house quick her husband came home and this is me and he goes you got to be crazy i said listen dude just let me in let me in let me in i said i'm freezing just take me anywhere and he says get in i looked in the back i go i go is there anything back here i could use as a shirt and, which i and there was of course cigarettes i go you bastard. I know what you're doing. I go, I says, Jesus. I said, where'd you get all the cigarettes? And then he little begrudgingly told me the story when I was insistent about, I talked about my, that I've been in prison. You know, after a couple of deliveries, he, he brought me to, he brought me to meet the bosses of the operation. But you were supposed to just observe, right? I was, they followed us. They knew I was on to something. And I made a judgment call. Like, I mean, I don't know who would ever think about taking all their clothes off and jump in front of a van in midwinter. You know, I mean, it's just, but it just seemed the natural thing to do. You know, so you yeah. get into the van and you're, you know, you're looking for a shirt. You got a shirt yeah. back here. You notice that they have some tobacco. Right. What did they say when you said that? I go, dude, what are you doing with all the cigarettes? You know, I said, he goes, well, that's how I'm delivering them. I go, well, I didn't, 
they from a warehouse and he looks at me. I played a little dumb at first. I go, I go, listen, I've done stolen stuff before because I went right to the story about having a bar and how I moved stolen merchandise. Where did he drop you off though? We sat in that parking lot for about 10 minutes. I had to convince him that I was going with him. You know, he even offered to go out and give me something, give me some clothes. I said, no, dude, I'm, I'm with you. You know, I was a bit, I was persistent. You know, I said, listen, I could do this. I, I know I could do this. And he told me the whole information. He gave me the operation situation, how far they get, did they were doing from, from Syracuse, New York. They were doing from the Pennsylvania border to the Canadian border. Eventually took me to the uh, minor storage facility where the operation was ran from. He was saying, we got to run. We got to run. We got to get out. I said, no, no, dude. I said, just take it easy. I says, he goes, there's cops all over the place. I go, yes, they are. In fact, I just said, listen, dude, you run, you're going to get shot. Okay. And I might get shot too. Cause, but I says, I'm an investigator. He couldn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? And I convinced him, stay in the truck. Just put your, oh, you know, put your hands out the window, which I did. And then they just took me right away. Billy says that he was a great undercover agent. What was his secret? Well, he never shuts up. My biggest thing is, which made me a good undercover was I go on and on. But I found out, like I learned from somebody, the more you talk, you confuse them. You know, I confuse the bad guys. They go, Jesus Christ. I asked Billy if he ever wore a wire. Anytime I met new people, I did not wear a wire because you're going to get patted down. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I interviewed Joe Pistone. You know who he is? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He never wore a wire. Only like sometimes he would wear a tape recorder in his boot. I go, you're interviewing that pussy, Joe Pistone. I go, he arrested five, six Italians. <laughs> he said, I said, I'm arrested terrorist. I bought bombs. I bought guns. I bought drugs. I got hired as a hitman. I said, who, you know, I'm, I go, who's a real undercover? I go, Billy says he's kidding, of course. He has respect for Pistone's undercover work playing Donnie Brasco. There's a ball breaking society between undercovers about who did the best you know there's a bit of an ego thing you know and obviously he's he's a famous guy well let's talk about that that, time where you almost got shot can you tell me that story yeah i was monitoring confidential informants because you use those a lot because they know the bad guys just monitor and make sure he doesn't make any deals on the side well lo and behold prior he made a deal on the side which i knew about and i said listen you do it again you're all done i'm not getting out to help you you're going to get the shit beat out of you a couple months pass by we're down in the bronx right around Yankee Stadium. And all of a sudden, he's arguing again. Now, we know what he's doing, but I felt bad for the guy. I get out to break up the situation. All of a sudden, someone comes from behind me and puts a gun to my head. You know, it, it clicks. Luckily, they end up getting the guy. I still, I still got the bullets that he had in the gun. So I kept those as a memento or a reminder. I've been in so many dangerous situations. I never gave that a thought. That's why you never know when things are going to go bad. I was under for so long, thus I had some issues mentally. I was not suffering from the PTSD that much yet. I didn't know what it was. You were in the thick of it. Yeah, I just, you go along what you go along with. And I, you know, sometimes it's been a while, but I'm going, I start getting flashbacks. I start getting nightmares from 9-11. I get flashbacks from where I was involved in a fatality, nothing to do with the undercover, but we killed a person on the highway. So I had a woman come through our windshield when I was in a police car. I still see her coming through the windshield. But then after I start getting nightmares about that, things happen. You know, obviously you think you're okay, but you kind of just filter that back. But so I pulled up an article from Syracuse.com, and right. they, they were talking about Gary Burstell, right? Is that his name, Gary? Yes, yes, yes. We're down in a warehouse in the Yonkers. We're doing business left and right. Yeah, we got involved in a gunfight, and this gentleman, Gary, is working next door. We had a big-ass warehouse, like, I won't say about, some of them are almost like a third of the size of a Walmart. He just got interested to us, another one who was impressed who we were because he saw, you know, the machine guns, the you know, scope rifles, and he saw the product we're doing. So he, again, assumed we were with the mafia. He knew us as bad guys because we're selling our illegal product, alcohol and cigarettes, right at the bay in this warehouse facility in Yonkers next to him. We're making major deliveries to Arabs all throughout New York City. We were loading our cigarettes. All of a sudden... He's going, oh, my God, you guys are the real deal. You know, he saw the machine guns, just thought we were the real bad guys. So he wanted a, a, he wanted to know if we could get him a silencer. And then he said, well, he can get us a bomb. So we thought he's being a just 
idiot, okay? So the next time he comes in with a bomb that he made in those big ass soup cans, like Campbell's has the real big ones, it was a, a, a tomato soup, and he slams it on her desk. I told you I'm the real deal. Well, we know nothing about bombs. Well, we, you know, everyone, everyone had stains in their pants, you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> you get smashed the bomb down. He got arrested, sent to jail, and we made, we made the newspapers. And it turned out when they raided his house, he had a dozen bombs, X amount of rifles and ammo. What was he planning on doing with all that? He was a white supremacist. He had this, the crosses and everything. They were going to kill black people. I mean, he used the word a lot different when I was conversing with him. A suspected bomber just lands on their lap. Lucky bastards. But that's not even the craziest story Billy told me. How about the time when he was commissioned to take a man out? I got hired as a hitman. Tell me about that. Tell me about the hitman. I want to be politically correct. He, they got the funny hair. Yeah, no, they even not Hasidic, Hasidic, oh, Hasidic okay. Jews. Okay, I don't. Oh, you're talking about the Hasidic Jews? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. They, we dealt with them too. Someone had robbed from them. First of all, they accused us of shorting them for the cigarettes. But I said, look at all the cigarettes. Get. We make millions of dollars. We're going to worry about short you a couple cases. So we got in a very argumentative situation. And I just said, don't bother coming back. And I got in their face, swearing at them, causing them. I said, so anyways, they came back and apologized because they knew this guy that they were sending to pick up the cigarettes was robbing from them. Okay. Now they want him killed. <laughs> so they said, they came to me. I says, We'd like him taken care of. We got to show a sign of force. Fortunately, the hit was called off and Billy says nobody got hurt. How about the time that Billy almost got tangled up in a shootout? Billy says that during an undercover sting, a group of black men planned on robbing him and his crew. Plan was, we we're going to talk to them because we know they had long coats and they had shotguns underneath them. All of a sudden, things happen. He loses it. Well, as soon as they walked in, he looks at the money. He rips up the money and he throws it in their face. This is counterfeit. Who do you think we are? And so all of a sudden I go, oh my God, I, they're reaching for their guns. I look up behind the guy and I just put the gun to his head and says, you know, I'm nothing I like better to kill, you know, a black bastard. You know, I got called down to internal affairs for using the N-word. You know, so just that's how the bureaucracy had to deal with we were in character and I had, we stopped a confrontation of a shootout with some really badasses and I got caught to internal affairs, but that, you know, but my boss, Tom Stanton, again, he's awesome. He came with me to the hearing. He goes, and listen, let me see if I got this straight. He diffused the situation. No one got hurt. He protected the integrity of the operation. And you're going to, of, of a, a word he used in a hostile, almost shootout situation, he just said, we're done here. You walked out. Why did you call it quits? Tell you the truth. They said, uh, others, oh, we're going to shut the operation down. Working 10 years undercover, I was not going to go sit at a desk. I wasn't going to put up with that crap. So I, I just put in my papers and said, I had enough. I didn't realize how burnt out I was. And plus, I became Billy the Liquor Guy. I was Billy the Liquor Guy for eight, nine years of the 10. You know what I'm saying? It was just who I was. Even when you came home to your family and all that? Yeah, I came home. My, and there were situations like we had to be careful. It was a blessing to end it because I was way beyond. I mean, I after about a year or two, it, it involved some, you know, I thought about suicide and everything. And it was, it got pretty dark in my life. You know, I just said, I, I can't do this because I went from traveling all over the country, chasing bad guys to I wouldn't even get off my couch for months. I knew there was something very wrong psychologically. We started off with you being a Gemini, you having this constant struggle of, yeah, right. I think like a criminal, but I'm in yeah. law enforcement. Now, 10 years after you've been undercover and your law enforcement career is over, looking back at your life, are you the good guy or are you the bad guy? A uh, little more of the good guy now because I'm a grandfather. In fact, I got a shot of reality the other day. I'm watching the kids. And they're watching the police guys and the army guys who got the, you know, they got the raid stuff. I go, Papa used to wear that. And they look at me as the old fat guy. Now. Billy says that at the end of the day, every good guy has a price. My, my, my price is about eight million, but thank God I never had that much. But because, because even if you start there for a million dollars, what are you going to do with a million dollars? It sounds like a lot, but then you got to worry about getting arrested. It's not worth it. You know what I'm saying? Did I think about, and uh, of course, some of the guys that did be involved with missing money, they all got fired. You know, so was it worth it? No. 
And other than uh, Bully the Liquor Guy, it's that's all in the past. If you want to hear more wild stories from Billy, check out his book, Under Too Long, by Billy the Liquor Guy. You know, Billy says he suffered from a lot of PTSD and he was going to see a therapist. And during the session, he started telling the therapist all these stories. And the therapist said, why don't you write these stories down and make it a book? So he did. And you can find this book anywhere you get ebooks. I'll have a link in the show notes. Next time on Pretend, we're going to turn the mic over to you. You guys send me stories all the time, and some of them are pretty wild. So I'm going to play them on this show. Also, don't forget, Pretend has a YouTube channel. I recently did an interview with Michael Torres, the treasure hunter. You know, there were a lot of stories that he told me during the recordings of those episodes, but a lot of them didn't have anything to do with the actual case that we were talking about. And they're wild. Very, very unbelievable. (laughs) So go check it out, the interview. You tell me what you think. Is he full of it or is he a real treasure hunter? And also, I want to thank my Patreon supporters because a lot of you have been supporters of the show for many years. And I am so grateful. You have no idea how important your support is to keep this show alive. You know, this is a very expensive hobby and you guys make it happen. And so I'm going to invite some of my top Patreon supporters to co-host with me on YouTube one day. You know, maybe we could talk about your favorite con artist documentary or your favorite historical con artist, whatever it is. I'm going to reach out to my top Patreon supporters and if they want to come on the show on the YouTube channel, they're more than welcome. So go ahead and check out the Pretend YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, type in Pretend Podcast, boom, subscribe, ring the little bell and all that good stuff. Anyways, all right, guys, that's it for today. Also, make sure to check out season two of Criminal Conduct. It's a crazy story that's going on right now in real time. So I don't even know where this is going. All right, seriously, that's it. Talk to you next time. Jody Loomis, Jessica Baggin, Kelly Ann Prosser, Michelle Martinko, Christy Mirak, Carolyn Rose. Do these names mean anything to you? All these people are murder victims whose cases were cold for decades until recently. They were solved by investigative genetic genealogy. This new crime-solving tool is rapidly providing us with the names of elusive killers. But each one of these cases is unique and worth exploring. Each episode of the DNA ID podcast will focus on one newly solved case and look at the story behind the headline. Who was the victim? Who was their killer? And why did this tragic crime occur? It's brought to you by Abjack Entertainment, hosted and produced by me, Jessica Betancourt, and co-produced by Mike Morford. Make sure you subscribe to DNA ID today, wherever you listen to podcasts, so you don't miss a single episode. Creative Power.